Okay, folks, I'm Jeffrey Fox. This is the Space and Energy Unit, and it's the lesson on energy. And this is part of the AI First Engineering um, curriculum. Here we are. This is space, which is staggering in my opinion. I am just so astonished to see how impressive the industry contribution to space is. I, I, I spent a lot of my life in Pasadena, California, next to Jet Propulsion Lab, which is a highly successful NASA lab. But if I look at the operation of, and then I was, my view of sp commercial space was companies like Boeing and, and SAIC and um, ones which really were not very impressive, very bureaucratic. But the new companies in space are so energetic and exciting and they're entrepreneurial. It's just an incredible change. Um, I should say the um, rather bureaucratic attitude of previous uh, space companies isn't necessarily the fault of the companies. It was probably the fault of the government funding because they really didn't separate themselves from government. They didn't have private investments directly in them. All right, so here we have two slides. One says space supporting AI. The next will have AI supporting space. And um, AI can actually be, be helped by space in the global navigation because you can have uh, the global navigation satellite systems which tell people where you are. Those clearly are very important for AI applications and mapping and things. They're also important in logistics, because you can use the geospatial location of everything to do a much better job of delivery. Uh, there's an area which is um, Earth observation, which calls, which is the satellites looking down, capturing images, and um, clearly that, that, that observation can be optimized and um, and, and, and the images themselves are hugely valuable, because um, as well as some rather obvious military cases, they have the disaster applications, identification of deforestation, and things like that. Ice sheets, we use them to in polar science. And of course, the uh, satellites enable communication, which is collects the data from edge devices and sends them off for, to the cloud for training. Okay, here we have uh, AI supporting space, um, and we this article identified four areas: manufacturing. Remember, modern manufacturing or digital manufacturing has smart machines, all of which are AI controlled, and space can't survive without high-quality manufacturing. Satellites, rockets are all manufacturing intensive. Imaging. AI can choose the best images to take, and uh, AI, as we discussed, is rewarded by deducing things from the image in the previous slide. Uh, telemetry and control, AI is used to, um, telemetry is all the material things sent back from the space, and you can both monitor that telemetry and send feedback back to, to, to optimize the activities in the satellites. Uh, SpaceX, this very well-known commercial company, has implemented satellite collision by AI. And it can also do all sorts of other things to optimize the switching on of rockets and switching off of rockets and generally uh, avoiding collisions and everything. Um, slightly more subtle one is dynamic spectrum use. The satellite can actually learn to transmit using the most appropriate frequencies for interference and power and everything like that. That's a deep learning application. All right, here is an interesting uh, news release from 2011. That was nine years ago, almost exactly. And there's a refers back to a little article a few months before. And it's basically saying, wow, if we made uh, rockets like uh, self-driving cars, the rockets could do even better. Um, so 
launch vehicles with AI. Here is this series of rockets. Here's number version number four, um, Epsilon four, and um, it was recently launched, and it had actually seven um, smaller satellite, actually rockets and satellites inside it, and it was testing them out. Um, now we can look a little bit about uh, though the private space program, namely what how is how is the private sector basically revolutionized space? And uh, here is the SpaceX's space starship rocket system uh, in a symbolic uh, artist impression. And uh, in 20, by 2019. Uh, the total investment in space was almost $26 billion. That was the cumulative, but even 2019 had the largest of the annual investments. That's shown in more detail here. Here's 2019, here is the 26 billion. Here's the actual things they can tie down to Pacific sectors uh, with um, uh, satellite related sectors being the largest. About half of that amount. Uh, launch uh, technology, almost another half. And then a lot smaller number in the various other instruments and other related tech and IT related technologies. And here is this um, Starship Mark I prototype from SpaceX. Okay, this is a discussion of. Um, Spacecraft, which is relative. I mean, we haven't been as we see. Here's the early space space missions. 1972 uh, was the last real spacecraft, and then we've had the space shuttle, which is a sort of a pseudo spaceship, which didn't which just trundles around the Earth, and um, you can see how the cost is. Um, this is the cost per seat, so the, the number of cost per getting an astronaut in the into space has significantly declined. It's not not so surprising that it um, was big back at the beginning, but uh, I believe Starliner is a relatively recent thing, and and it's also not just the U.S. Soyuz, the Russian one, also is quite expensive. And this picture, well, it's uh, you know we're so jaded with science fiction that pictures of spacecraft aren't that uh, necessarily that exciting. But uh, this is it is exciting that we're able to really get started back into space. And uh, it's almost in spite of NASA, as I think I've mentioned that. But it's the fact that NASA supported the private, uh, more entrepreneurial private endeavors is impressive, and they should be congratulated on that, on that, uh, those actions. Here is an interesting uh, um, slide. You will see even more detail if you go to this YouTube uh, link here, which uh, has a picture of uh, actually this is just taken from that. It was just captured at one time, and towards the end, it basically records the launching of these different satellites. 57,000 satellites through 2029. It's so far launched 9,000, and uh, 2,200 of those 9,000 are still awake, uh, alive. I mean, they're still functioning, and. These are the names starting in 2017 of the companies launching satellites, with SpaceX and Boeing at the bottom, Amazon in the middle, all sorts of companies. And a lot of these are low Earth orbiting satellites, which uh, have special possibilities in terms of helping communication on Earth. Because if, if you're low Earth orbiting, then the delay of getting to the satellite and back is not so serious. And you can use it for conventional uh, internet applications. Uh, so here is the discussion of low Earth ordering, low Earth orbit satellites, and um, they are being used a lot for basically fi either filling in service, cell service, or um, creating cell service. In areas which it doesn't exist because they're so rural and isolated, it is not cost effective to produce 
conventional network infrastructure. If you're living in a big city, conventional network infrastructure will be cheaper. Um, so this is a lot, as you notice, Amazon was on the previous thing. And um, there are actually, of course, one reason Amazon and Google and people like this is if they can increase the number of people with internet connection, they can increase the number of ads they can sell or the number of Amazon, the number of books and uh, cookies you can sell. Amazon was one of the players in the uh, slide. We had three global slide of all those satellites. We had three slides ago. And here are some details about this project, Kuiper. And it involves 3,000, over 3,000 low Earth orbit satellites. And it has the usual goal of trying to, this being the cheapest way of getting to the places which um, are relatively unpopulated. And so it's rather hard to justify the expensive um, building of land, land lines. And it seems these 3,000 will cost 10 billion. And um, they should be up and running by in a few years, uh, half of them by 2026. Um, but it needs 20% um, of them to actually get started. And of course, Amazon isn't doing this out of its um, purely altruistically, it is trying to sell products. And uh, by delivering, by having good internet connection to rural, uh, the rural places, it can sell, it can send its um, website to those places and people can dial into their website and buy things. So that's why I presume they're doing it. But it will have, of course, general value because once you have a um, satellite connection, you can, not, you can use it for whatever you want. And of course, the other companies such as Google are also interested in this area for a similar, somewhat uh, uh, so a somewhat self-serving reason, which is not bad. That's a win-win. This is a win-win solution. So I don't think we should uh, say anything negative about it. And the claim is that the FCC will be awarding um, money to service this uh, these rural communities, and so perhaps uh, Amazon can get the FCC to pay some of that ten billion dollars. All right, that's Project Cooper. Here is just a little remote, recent one about uh, illustrating the danger of uh, being a startup. Now, I don't think the coronavirus affects the space directly very much. On the other hand, it um, creates financial pressures because people, companies, projects are delayed. But if you're under a gun and have to produce by day X, if you're delayed, then maybe you're bankrupt. This is a company that launched 74 satellites, and it wanted to do 10 times more. And it had established the necessary ground station infrastructure, or rather half of it. Um, I gather SpaceX was suspending a rocket launch due to the virus. And this is a general statement. Startups are in a precarious situation. Because they have such a they're such a risky system uh, that um, a nobody wants to have risks, so they're not going to get funding. Period, and they're less likely to succeed if the whole business environment has collapsed. Uh, here is a discussion of uh, of uh, some AI in NASA with something called the Frontier Development Lab which came from Ames Lab, and um, it paired um, experts from NASA and the companies with students and uh, to do so open source, publicly available, and then looking at things like finding asteroids, planets, uh, studying the sun and things like that. Um, Another, there's an interesting example here. We'll come back to this one about uh, exoplanets. Um, this malfunctioning sensor is sort of interesting in that um, 
you were able to learn a dead sensor. And the reason you can learn a dead sensor is you had some um, data when it was working, and you take that data and you establish the correlations between that data and other sensors. Then if uh, a week later, the sensor in, in, in which you're addressing is, is broken and forever, but the other sensors are still valid, you can use that write a deep learning network to um, predict the result of, um, of this uh, original sensor. So this is called a virtual sensor. Here is a picture of using AI to reconstruct um, Asteroids, here is the uh, uh, Eros um, asteroid, and it um, is, re is, is 3D um, reconstruction is, is created by AI from the photography. And um, this took um, about four days with, a, with an AI program, and it would take several months with a real person to trying to do it. So that's the last, and this was developed in this NASA Frontier Development Lab. So I'm gonna leave it there and have a pleasure field, have a great time in the future and keep safe. Thank you very much.